Austerlitz. Time and the Living Dead. It does not seem to me, Austerlitz added, that we understand the laws governing the return of the past, but I feel more and more as if time did not exist at all. Only various spaces interlocking according to the rules of a higher form of stereometry, between which the living and the dead can move back and forth as they like. And the longer I think about it, the more it seems to me that we who are still alive are unreal in the eyes of the dead, that only occasionally, in certain lights and atmospheric conditions, do we appear in their field of vision. Join us today as we explore the fourth and final novel of W.G. Sebald, a melancholy meditation of the dark side of human history, with chronological and geographical mazes that are as haunting as they are compelling, like a snake swallowing its own tail. Now please, sit back and enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. Published in 2001, the same year of its author's premature death at 57 years old, Austerlitz received the National Book Critics Circle Award and was ranked fifth of the hundred best books written in the 21st century by The Guardian. But before we dive into the novel, let's first take a glimpse at its author. W.G. Sebald was born in Bavaria in 1944 to a father who was in the Wehrmacht under the Nazi regime. As a young boy, his father was held as a POW until 1947 and so his dominant male role model was his grandfather. The plight of the Jewish people, post-war Germany, and the Holocaust is reflected throughout his novels, even if by fractal elements. Sebald was first shown images of the Holocaust while in school and recalls how no one knew how to explain its horrors. I don't know where it quite comes from, but I do like to uh, listen to people who have been sidelined for one reason or another. Because in my experience, once they begin to talk, they have to tell you, they have things to tell you that you won't be able to get from anywhere else. And I felt that need of being able to listen to people telling me things from very early on, not least, I think, because I grew up in post-war Germany where there was, I say that quite often, something like a cons conspiracy of silence, i.e., you know, your parents never told you anything about their experiences because there was, at the very least, a great deal of shame attached to these experiences. So one kept them under lock and seal. And I, for one, doubt, you know, that uh, my mother and father, even amongst themselves, ever, you know, broached any of these subjects. And there wasn't a written or... Uh, spoken agreement about these things. It was a tacit agreement. It was something that was never touched on. So I've always, I've grown up feeling, you know, that there is some sort of emptiness somewhere that needs to be filled by accounts from uh, witnesses one can trust. And once I, you know, started, uh, and I would never have encountered these witnesses if I hadn't left my native country at the age of 20 because the people who could tell you the truth as, you know, or something at least approximating the truth did not exist in that country any longer, but one could find them in Manchester and in Leeds or in North London or in Paris uh, or in various places in Belgium and so on. Sebald eventually became a lecturer at the University of East Anglia in the 1970s where he completed his Ph.D., and eventually became a chair of European literature and founding director of the British Centre of Literary Translation. A UEA colleague of Sebald's, Christopher Bigsby, says of him, He had originally taught German literature and had published the kind of books that academics do, but he got increasingly frustrated and began to write in what he called an elliptical way, breaching the supposed boundaries between the fact and fiction not what you're supposed to do as an academic. It seems to me an invisible referent that as we go from the tr zoo to the train station, from the train station to the fortress, from the fortress to the jail, to the insane asylum, mm. that the missing term is the concentration camp. Yes. Mm. And that always circling is this silent presence mm. 
being left out but always gestured toward. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, that corresponds, your description corresponds very much to, to, to my intentions. I've always felt that it was necessary above all to write about uh, the history of persecution, of vilification of minorities, the uh, attempt well nigh achieved to eradicate a whole people. And uh, I was in pursuing these ideas at the same time conscious that it's practically impossible to do this, to write about concentration camps, in my view, is practically impossible. So you need to find uh, ways of convincing the reader that this is something that is on your mind, uh, but that you do not necessarily roll out you know, uh, uh, you know, on every other page. But that the re reader needs to be prompted that the narrator has a conscience and that he is and has been perhaps for a long time engaged with these questions. And uh, this is why, you know, the, the, the main scenes of horror are never directly addressed. I think it is sufficient to remind people because we've all seen images, uh, but these images militate against our capacity for discursive thinking, for... Um, uh, reflecting upon these things and also paralyze, as it were, our moral capacity. So the only way in which one can approach these things, in, 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 in my view, is obliquely, tangentially, by, uh, by reference rather than by direct confrontation. Sebald utilizes an unbreaking style, reminiscent of Thomas Bernhard, with no paragraph or chapter breaks as his meandering prose articulates a world without time that is supplemented by photographs of people, structures, landscapes, and tokens that instills a sense of reading a memoir. Yes, I'm not entirely sure that I'm able to make sense out, out of you know, whatever I come across at all, except in the effort of recording it. So. Uh, whatever sense there is, is primarily an aesthetic sense. And I realize, you know, that making in prose a decent pattern out of what happens to come your way is uh, a preoccupation with, which, in a sense, has no higher ambitions, really, than for a brief moment in time to rescue something out of that stream of history that keeps rushing past. And this is why I have, among other reasons, why I have photographs in the text, because the photograph is perhaps the paradigm of it. The photograph is meant to get lost somewhere in a box, in an attic. It's a, a nomadic thing that uh, you know, has a small chance only to survive. And I think we all know that feeling you know, when we come accidentally across a photographic document being of one of our lost relatives, being of a totally unknown person. And we get the sense of appeal. They're stepping out, having been found by somebody after decades or half centuries, having been found by somebody, all of a sudden they come stepping back over the threshold and they say, we were here two months and please uh, take care of us for a while. Illustrations of the book, at first glance, it's odd. You yeah. don't find a novel or a travel story with yeah. so many illustrations yeah. that, moreover, are a functional part of the yeah. text. They don't illustrate the text, they help the text further on. Yeah. I mean, the sentence ends at the top of the picture, and then the picture is part of, of the yeah. story. Mm. Um, so it's, it's far more convincing than Miss Marple telling you that it well, was Well, yes, but nevertheless, you know, there's the same there's the possibility for the same sleight of hand that makes uh, crime fiction possible because it's all, it can be all arranged retrospect. So I had the clipping, I only needed to invent the character that goes with it and associate him with the main figure in the text. In this case, it happens to be true. <laughs> 
Oh yes, that, that was the thing I, I suspected. But, but most uh, of them are, are true. Most of them are true, but there are several which I made up. And uh, so, you know, the reader must be constantly asking, uh, is this so or isn't it so? And of course, this is one of the central problems of fiction. The 19th century authors are always at pains to point out that they found this manuscript, yes. you know, in a, that's, in that's a bedroom, work, in yes. a bedroom in Husum. Yes. And uh, they, therefore, it's true. Yes. They're not telling a story they've made up. They're recording real life. Yes. And of course, in a sense, we still have that problem as narrators. Yes. His prose are recognized as old-fashioned and elaborate German. In one instance, there's a sentence that famously continues for all of nine pages. It's not of this time. I mean, there are um, hypotactical syntax forms in these sentences which uh, have been abandoned by practically all the writers now for reasons of convenience, also because simply they are no longer accustomed to it. But if you dip into any form of 18th or 19th century discursive prose or the English essayists, for instance, these forms exist in, 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 in previous uh, uh, ages of, of, of literature. And uh, they simply have fallen into disrepair. The novel begins with the unnamed narrator who first meets Jacques Austerlitz by chance in the Antwerp Railroad Station in the 1960s. The two hit it off and fall into an hours-long conversation about the architecture of the building that turns into a larger discussion on the history of Europe's fortified cities. I had read about Brain Donc uh, before in connection with uh, Jean Améry, but the difference is staggering, you know, whether you, you just read about it or whether you actually go and um, spend several days in and around there to see what these things are actually like. Austerlitz is an architectural historian with a wide-ranging knowledge of architecture to zoology. A friendship or companionship of sorts evolves from their meetings, which picks up where the last falls off, as if time between each meeting doesn't exist. These meetings are not so much of a conversation, as the narrator rarely interrupts his enigmatic counterpart, who eventually shares the story of his life, since the narrator is a natural listener. What follows is a series of meetings over the course of decades. In 1939, Austerlitz was adopted by a Welsh family, a Calvinist minister and his wife, and raised in a cold yet otherwise stolid household. During this time, he went by the Welsh name of Dafid Elias. It's not until years later, as a student at a private school, when he learns his true name. A teacher attributes his name to a Czech town where Napoleon won a famous battle over the combined Russian and Austrian forces, which is featured in Tolstoy's War and Peace. By another coincidence, he learns years later that Fred Astaire's real name was in fact Frederick Austerlitz. He later learned from Austerlitz that he is the son of Czechoslovakian Jews. His mother sent him to London on a kinder transport after the Germans marched in and realized that there was no escape for both of them. It's not until after his 50s, when he allows himself to recognize the Holocaust that took from him both of his parents, an opera singer and a manager of a small slipper factory. Austerlitz himself, as an adult, then conspired, as it were, against his own will uh, in this uh, erasing of his own identity and constructed in his mind a, a system of avoidance which allowed him to ignore that which constantly troubled him. But as he drew towards retirement age, as so often happens, he felt obliged to confront this problem. And he goes in search, as someone aged around 60, of his own identity a route which eventually takes him back to his native city of Prague, where he meets a woman now in her 80s called Vera, who uh, was his childminder uh, whilst his mother an actress, or when his mother an actress was busy of an evening. And uh, the 
A, a large uh, tract of the book is uh, occupied with the conversations between Österlitz and Vera. Throughout the novel, Sebald explores themes of time and the living dead. In Escaping the Flood of Time, Noah's Ark and W.G. Sebald's Austerlitz, Carl McTagg writes how water is used as a metaphor for time. He cites the first golden picture on page 43 of the Freemasons' temple of the Great Eastern Hotel in London, a toy ark in the billiards room of Ivor Grove, in the new Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's in the narrator's first meeting with Austerlitz on page 8 and 9 in the image of the mighty clock. Later time is referred to as the most artificial of all our inventions. During this initial meeting, U.R. Bowie of Dactyle Review notes the uncanny similarities between Austerlitz and the narrator writing. More evidence here that doppelgangers of the narrator are meant to be of a double representation of Austerlitz himself in that it is difficult to conceive of two men who have just met having this rather strange mutual perspective on the movements of a clock's hand. It's unclear if the narrator is an alter ego of Austerlitz or a surrogate for the reader themselves. Throughout the novel, Austerlitz pushes back against the concept of time, refusing to wear a watch or abide by its unnatural confinement. He doesn't believe time can pass and that one can simply turn back to find everything as it was. When visiting the old country house of Ivor Grove with his old history teacher while attending Oxford, they find an old billiards room seemingly unaffected by time. It was in this room that had a profound effect on his teacher, who could hardly fathom how a room, sealed away so long from the flow of the hours and days and succession of generations, affected him in such a way. The novel functions much in the same way as a maze does. Ted Goya of the New Canon writes, The narrator meets up with Austerlitz in London on Saturday, March 19, 1977, and hears him recall his visits to a train station in 1984, which prompts a lengthy discourse on the construction of the station in the 1860s and the relation of an anecdote about explorations in the station's now disused waiting room that reminded Austerlitz of an afternoon meeting in November of 1968. But Austerlitz hardly gives this 1968 story time to form when he switches gears and recalls his sudden realization in 1984 that this train station waiting room was the place where he had first come to England as a small child 50 years before. On and on the maze winds in lengthy paragraphs, usually continuing for so many pages that it sometimes seems as if this novel is one single paragraph until all sense of where the narrator is centered is eradicated in a blissful yet anxiety-provoking simultaneity. Goya likens this moment to the Madeline moment in Proust's remembrance of things past. However, rather than magical or transformative, Austerlitz's recollection is psychically draining and ends with a dissolution of his fragile sense of self. It is after this breakdown in 1922 that provokes Austerlitz to look back into his history in earnest. He then learns how his mother was interned in the Terezin camp by the Nazis, and then shipped off to her death in 1944. His father was last seen in Paris who he fantasizes of running into by sudden chance, although he most likely perished in the deportations. Austerlitz retraces his steps back to his childhood home in Prague to find clues of the fate of his parents. There he meets an old woman named Vera, who shares with him stories of his youth. It seems that Sebald merges his voice with the narrator, and even teases the thought that the boy in the white ruffles on the front cover could be him, or Austerlitz, or someone who has significance to the novel. Charles Sumarez Smith of The Guardian writes, What are we to make of this? In some ways, the account is emblematic of many ostensibly ineffectual lives, of an academic intelligence wasted in a grandiose intellectual project that requires years of taking notes but never leads to the grand book that should have resulted from it, until the narrator decides to burn all the accumulation of material in a small bonfire in the garden of his terrace house. But at the same time, and in a way that is highly distinctive, the book provides a strangely transcendent and hypnotic sense of the power of history and of the relationships between an individual 
and the accidents of their life. Uh, I think Benjamin at one point says that there is no point in exaggerating that which is already horrific. And from that, by uh, extrapolation, one could conclude that perhaps in order to get the full measure of the horrific, one needs uh, to remind the reader of beatific moments of life. Uh, because if you, uh, as it were, existed solely with your imagination in le monde concentrationnaire, then you would uh, somehow not be able to sense it. And so it requires that contrast. And the contrast is, uh, and the old-fashionedness of the diction or of the narrative tone is therefore uh, nothing to do with nostalgia for a better age that's gone past, but it is simply something that, as it were, heightens uh, the awareness of that which we have managed to engineer in this century. In the end, Austerlitz embarks on one last search in order to learn more so he could be delivered from the darkness of unknowing. But that's just it. There's nothing that remains, and he himself has become a wraith. Though humanity never ceases, even though what Sebald writes is considered fiction, what he captures is something more real that adds to the emptiness and loss that millions had endured. And that makes for the most powerful fiction. We hope that you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing. Subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure. Hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop. And leave a comment with your thoughts on this video, along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.